recording so we can get going. And Tom, do you want me to run the slides? You'll have to. I'm pretty sure I can't share from the Chrome. I've never been able to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So let me just um, get that working. And share my screen. And, and just so you all see, that's our schedule for today. And Tom Kuhn is going to be our first speaker. So take it away, Tom. Uh, thank you, Mike, um, and good morning to everyone. Um, so yeah, so with calendars and orbits and how they work together, that's what I'm gonna talk about. So next slide, please. Okay, so, so the basic concept between, um, behind the time management system within GIS is that there's some notion of an absolute model time. And that somehow relates to the orbit, which tells us things um, about relative angles and such, you know, what, what, what part of the planet is being illuminated at any given time. And we also translate that absolute time into something which looks like a calendar for the purposes of diagnostics and sort of human understanding what's going on. People don't normally think just in terms of hour angles, declination angles, and, and uh, that kind of such thing. We want years, months, dates, day of year, hours, seconds. That's what we consider to be the calendar, sometimes called a clock. All right, uh, next slide. So the basic way in which we um, define a calendar for an exoplanet is by analogy with the standard um, orbit and calendar of the Earth. So on the left, you'll see a picture uh, sketching out the orbit of the Earth. And these things weren't ovals at one point, but somehow in all the translation, they got a little bit stretched. So um, the, the sun was supposed to be a circle. Uh, anyways, any given month, um, the planet um, subtends some angle. Okay, and because the Earth has sort of a funny calendar in the first place, the Julian calendar or Julian approximation calendar, um, these are uneven, but they're also uneven slightly due to other orbital effects related to the uh, eccentricity of the orbit um, and when we're closest to the sun and such. So we take those angles per month and we bring them over and we ask that we get the same angles in that same month for the exoplanet. And the, the fixed point between the two is we keep the spring equinox fixed at the at a constant fraction of the year, uh, roughly roughly a third of the way out. I forget exactly what you use. It's what April twentieth or something, or March twentieth, twenty first in the other calendar. Um, and then of course we say on January first that whatever your prime meridian is, we call that midnight. This was actually a typo in the slides from last year. If anybody was paying attention, I said it was noon on, on, at midnight, which doesn't make sense. Um, and we keep the notion of hours being something that there's 24 of in a day. So this is one of the departures from the way some other groups do this. An hour is not always 3,600 seconds, but there's always 24 hours in a day, okay? Equal hours. Um, and this is just slightly off the bottom of the screen, that last note at the bottom. Oh, um, yeah, the, we, we, for most of the cases, there'll be some exceptions in a minute, we require that the number of rotations of the planet exactly divide into the period of the total orbit. Um, for instance, when we look at when, when GIS implemented the Earth calendar and Earth orbit, they have 365 integral days in the orbit, even though the real orbit is actually like 365.25, and that's why we get leap years and such. So we ignore those kind of things exoplanet. We make a small adjustment to the orbital period to get that exact multiplicity in there. Next slide. Okay, so all that works pretty well, and you get a calendar which you know seems you know clear enough. You can do do this for Mars, and you'll get something which is amazingly similar and yet different enough to be sort of fun to stare at. But if you get to a more extreme case where the frequency of the orbit is no longer much much less than the frequency of the rotation of the planet, then um, this this analogy starts to break down. Um, but if we have that approx sorry, if we, if, we, if we violate that, if we have that approximation, then we have the, the integral number of solar days per year works pretty well. We're not having to make a major adjustment to the period of the orbit. And dividing things roughly into 12 equal months works pretty well because that means we're gonna have lots of days in each one of the months. So when we get to the slow rotators and we no longer have that nice separation in time scales, things get a little bit wonky. And so that's what most of this is gonna be about. All right, so next slide. Okay. So one of the um, things that we put in there is that when you've got a slow rotator, you still always have at least 120 calendar days in a year. 
And we have, so now we have to start being careful when we say day, what we mean by day. So ordinarily when I'm saying day, I mean solar day, and it's how long it is between noon one day and noon the next day. But when we talk about calendar days now, but these slow rotators, it's no longer connected. You know, your, 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 your 120 days, that one day could be entirely night, could be entirely day, could, you know. Um, but we at least break it down to these small units so that the months have some meaningful lengths in terms of days. But once you get there, you should, of course, you know, be wary of anything called a diurnal diagnostic. Right. Uh, monthly average can also be misleading at this point because if you're slow enough rotator, you can have an entire month that is daytime for your hemisphere, um, which is not quite so uh, useful to be doing for monthly averages at that point. So usually you're starting to talk about yearly averages as the, as the smallest scale you can actually make sensible use of the diagnostics. And even that doesn't work so well once you get to a truly slow rotator like Venus. Here, in order to get anything like Venus's orbit, we actually have to deactivate that requirement I mentioned on the earlier slide, where we adjust the orbit so that um, the period of the rotation and the period of the calendar are integral multiples of each other. We, we, we allow that to be turned off, but now you get a really weird thing in that the calendar is now completely divorced even from the notion of the, the, the orbit itself, right? So from year, sorry, from seasons. From year to year, um, the, the seasons are now going to uh, float. And so in order to get good diagnostics in this scenario, you really need to run enough years that you sort of have close to this, close to an integral number, both of calendar years, because that's what the diagnostics are in terms of, and in terms of orbital years, so that you actually get um, a, uh, a sensible number of averages of what's physically actually happening. Um, of course, a lot of these very slow rotators, things are tidally locked. And so if you're not extremely eccentric, these issues sort of vanish because then, you know, there's really no change from day to day within the year of that planet. But, but uh, for Venus, you end up needing to do a fairly large number of years to get something meaningful out here. All right, uh, next slide. That might be it. Okay, so, so what do you actually have to do to do any of this? So first of all, in order to activate anything that is not the default for the Earth, you have to put planet name equal in your run deck. And this is to protect all the Earth scientists that don't want to be too bothered by what we're doing with Rocky 3D. Um, so no matter what you do for all this other stuff, it's essentially ignored if you don't put that planet name in there. So so, so be cognizant. That. Doesn't matter what you put there other than Earth. Um, and anything will trigger the rest of the switches. Okay, so then the parameters beyond that. So obliquity, you specify in degrees. Eccentricity, um, same as for modern Earth, uh, is the default. Uh, longitude at periapsis, specified in degrees. The sidereal orbital period, you specify in seconds. The sidereal rotation period is also specified in seconds. Um, and that's the, and that's the uh, boy, I'm starting to doubt my own notes here. I think it's the orbital period. No, I guess it is the rotation. If, if somebody cares which one of those is adjusted, let me know and I'll get back to it. I haven't looked at the code in a while. I no longer remember which one of those is adjusted. And then quantize your length, which is by default true, is the thing that actually forces that adjustment to get that integral multiplicity in there. If you set it to false, then nothing gets adjusted. And then one of the more recent parameters we've added is for the equation of time. So for the Earth, um, uh, Earth-based model, the equation of time was not implemented. And so it was what we consider to be off by default. But once we got to some of the uh, some of the resonant orbits, the two, three orbit and such, we found that that was an important effect to include. And so we implemented something to get the equation of time in there. And I'm not really good at 3D visualization. So I didn't do the obliquity correctly when I did that, but I got something that worked well for the case we had on hand. And eventually we realized, okay, yeah, the obliquity needs to be handled correctly here too. So I went and did the, you know, the four, the, the full correct implementation, but in order to have backward compatibility with that intermediate version, we have this thing called naive, which again, for a lot of cases is, is perfectly fine. But if you really want to include the equation of time, which matters if you have a highly high eccentricity and a very slow uh, orbit, sorry, slow uh, rotation, then you'll want to go to on and then you'll get that full effect there. Um, a couple other parameters that are in there, but you don't usually need to use. Um, one is mean distance. Uh, there's already another mechanism in the model that presumably somebody mentioned that you can vary the effective solar flux at the planet. Um, so this sort of duplicates that effect, but it lets you scale. By default, it, it's, it's, it's in terms of AU for the planet. So it really comes down to what you consider to be your primary for the uh, solar radiation. But you can scale that out. If you want something that's going to get, you know, one-fourth as much radiation, you can set mean, mean distance to two. And But you could also do that by, like I said, the other mechanism. 
And then there's also our angle offset, which if you have a purely hypothetical exoplanet um, is, is somewhat meaningless. But if you're actually loading specific topography and you want to see how it matters for, you know, again, this usually is for a slow rotator um, where this kind of stuff matters more. And you want to see if it matters um, where the, uh, the, the part of the planet that's exposed to the sun for a long time is in that topography, then you'll need this hour angle offset to control that. Um, and that's because the prime rating is defined by the topography file. Okay, okay next slide. I think uh, that's that's it. it. So I guess now we have time for questions. Yes. So uh, I'm not sure Tom will be here this afternoon for the Q and A. So if you have a question about the calendaring system, which is complex as you may have noticed, now is the time to ask. But uh, implementation is pretty straightforward. I think we've not had any problems with it. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's true. Most of the problems aren't problems. They just seem like they are until we understand why it's surprising. Exactly, exactly. Okay. Okay. Uh, Mike, you can reach me on Teams this afternoon. You need to jump back in if there are questions. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Tom. Yeah. Really appreciate yeah, cheers. it. Cheers. Yeah. Cheers. Okay, I thought I would just, I'll just talk a, a slide or two and then Igor will jump in. Um, so we have mentioned these uh, boundary condition files uh, on a number of occasions. And I uh, thought we could just mention them again a little bit here. Um, as I mentioned, we have these, uh, these previous uh, run decks available in, this, uh, in our publication directory on the NS NCCS server, that URL I, I pointed to in the beginning. So one thing you may want to consider, which we've again discussed a little bit, is if you want to understand what kinds of different boundary condition files you need for a given configuration, it'd probably be worth your while to compare our template P1SOM40, that uh, P1 being, meaning that it's a, a fully coupled ocean and S being the Socrates radiation. And again, Eric Wolf will talk a bit about that later, but I don't think we've explicitly mentioned that, but our model does have two radiation schemes. One is the default earth radiation scheme, which is very fast, but which is extremely tuned, highly tuned and, and for that reason, very fast for the earth, modern day earth climate, but it's not useful for non-modern climates. And for that reason, we implemented a, a completely different radiation scheme called Socrates, which comes out of the UK Met Office, which we have coupled to the model. So that S means that we're using the Socrates. And again, um, O is ocean. M means medium resolution, which is the four by five, lat lawn by degrees, and then 40 layers. So you can compare you know, that P1 to say an aquaplanet run, we have several aquaplanet runs that we did, for example, on the Proxima Centauri paper. So if you go to that directory, you can look at the run deck there. And you can look at different things there. For example, the atmosphere initial conditions file. So there's an entry in the run deck for AIC equals to that file. Typically for aquaplanets, we set all the winds in that file to zero, and we might set the, the temperature to be isothermal to what we think the planet's going to be in roughly temperature wise. You don't want to shock the model setting your atmospheric initial conditions to say plus 50 and when it should be at, you know, say five degrees centigrade. We've also talked about these, uh, the topo, the topography file and the topo OC file, that's the topography for the ocean file. And of course the ocean initial conditions file. Then we have a set of, of other kinds of runs that we've done over the years. Uh, for example, our Climates One paper, which again has all these files available in our repository, where we run a kind of a modern earth, but with what we call a bathtub ocean. So that at the continental boundaries, we set the depth of the ocean to say 560 meters. And then the rest of the ocean is set to, in that case, I think it was 1360 meters depth. The advantage of that, of course, as I mentioned previously, is that a shallower ocean comes into equilibrium faster. And that's one of the reasons we did that. Then we have in, our, in one of our Venus habitability papers, we have also posted all of those files. In that case, we used a modern Venus topography, but we gave it several different ocean depths. But in this case, I'm mentioning a three 10 meter ocean depth. In this case, you get this river directions file, which I mentioned before, which is a, a a bit of a difficult file to make, but you could grab that file and use it. And as I said, in Planet 2.0, we expect that these files will be obsolete and that the, the river directions will be set automatically by the topography. That project's being led by Nancy King and, uh, and Gary Russell, who works on the Earth side of the house. 
We also have a different different varieties of land planets. I mentioned that we have a Venus land planet. That's where, for example, we gave it a 10 meter water equivalent layer across the, the planet. And most of that water ends up in, in small lakes distributed across the planet with, with no oceans. You can look at that there. You'll see there's no topo OC file or OIC file because there's no ocean in that case. And then we have these totally locked and even uh, three two spin resonant simulations with Proxima Centauri with CO2 dominant atmospheres, mostly CO2 dominant atmospheres. And we have a whole s selection of things where we did aqua planets, we did shallow aqua planets, deeper aqua planets. We did some with earth topography just to see what kind of effect topography would have because it changes the albedo and changes the ocean circulation as you might expect. And of course, Proxima Centauri orbits an M dwarf star with a completely different stellar spectrum, or solar spectrum, stellar spectrum, excuse me. And, and for that, you have to uh, put some different entries into your run deck. And again, if you compare the P1SOM40 template to one of these Proxima Centauri run decks, you'll see the difference in the spectral files, which again, Eric Wolf will talk a bit about later. And this Google Doc reporting to you shows you what the spectral files look like and, and what they're what their regions of validity are in a sense. You know, what kind of temperatures can they go to? What kind of atmospheric constituents can they handle? Things like that. And again, in the case of Proxima Centauri, you have to edit this planet params, underscore mod F90 file to put the planetary parameters in place. Okay. Um, so, yep, go ahead. Steven, you had a question? Not intentionally. Okay, no worries. Good. Uh, we'll move on. So I have mentioned a couple times uh, this, or we've mentioned a couple times throughout the tutorial, these uh, checkpoint restart files. And I say go back to this KRSFC slide 40, where we generate these kind of restart files you can use to restart runs with. And as I said, they're useful for small changes between configurations. So if you're doing a parameter sweep, and the and you don't expect the say the surface temperature to differ by much between your runs. You might want to use one of these RSF files you save from a previous run that's already in equilibrium. And as I said, it can save time to reach equilibrium. So if you save, let's say you change your solar insulation by two percent or five percent, this would be the perfect time to use an RSF file if you kept most things the same. But as I said yesterday, to use this RSF file, the the run decks have to have the same boundary condition files, but you can change a few things. And I just mentioned a couple here. You can change the orbital parameters and the insulation. You can change a few things in the parameter section of, of your run deck without, without any, any problems. Um, the, the way you use this is you use these RSF files in place of the AIC input file. I know it's a bit strange, uh, it, but it was a mechanism you know, that we're stuck with in the legacy sense. So even though you're replacing the atmosphere initial conditions file, your RSF file actually contains all of the all of the initial conditions for your run restart, including your ocean temperatures, salinity, currents, uh, surface temperatures, everything. So if you want to start your run with one of these RSF files in place of the AIC file, you would set I start equal to nine and your run will continue from the previous run um, with these changes you've implemented. In some cases, you might want to reset your ground hydrology, for example. You might want to reset the lake hydrology to what it was by default. And in that case, you would set it to A star, I start equals eight instead of I start equals nine. It's at the bottom of your, of your run deck. So I don't know if Igor or Kostas want to add anything else to what I've said here. Please chime in. Uh, yes. Uh, well, just a few words, I mean, in general about restart files. So uh, yes, they're used to restart different uh, jobs, but also uh, you want to save restart files. Like for example, if you're doing very old, very long, uh, very old ground, like, like maybe 10,000 years. Uh, so you want to have some benchmarks. So like if you are doing your run like for half a year, I mean, physical year, uh, and then find out that you actually wanted to look at something like you didn't implement certain diagnostic uh, and you want to look at uh, how it looked in the middle of the run, then you can go back to this restart file and uh, actually restart your job like at any point of the of the run that you were doing and it 
will exactly reproduce your arm. And for this purpose, uh, this you, you will be using I start equal to nine. So that's basically the main meaning of I start equal to, to nine. Reproduce run exactly, and exactly the same run. So the, the counting of the years also will be the same. Like uh, basically, you don't need to set a, a, a initial and ending. Well, you have to set ending, ending year, but not initial year in the in your I file. It will be taken from restart file. On the other hand, if you want to start new run, then typically you are not supposed to use uh, I start equal to nine because it will override certain things that you don't want to override like in your run deck. It will try to continue counting of the years from, from your restart file and not from your run deck. So for this reason, you, are, you want to use I start equal to eight, which by, defo by the definition means starting the new run. But I start equal to A8 also allows you to change certain things uh, in the initial conditions, which I start equal to nine doesn't allow you. And usually that's done by extra flags in the in your run deck. You can say, yes, reset ground hydrology, reset vegetation, like, uh, like remove snow because you want you accumulate too much snow and you want to start to accumulate it again, stuff like that. So there are a lot of flags which you can use and this will be disabled by I start to equal to nine. So unless you want to do, to do some, uh, some hack, just remember that when you start new run, you have to use I start equal eight. And when you want to reproduce the old run, you use I start equal to nine. And I guess that's the only thing I wanted to say about this. Yeah. Great. And uh, I also want to add on that, uh, that the, we have done some work in the earth model that propagated into the upcoming planet 2.0 that allows an exact continuation in the I start equals eight case. So in general, you should not care about an exact reproducibility of uh, binary reproducibility from the whatever you had in the restart file because it's a new run, you are resetting certain things and you're even maybe changing physics because that's the idea of I start eight. You might want to change the model completely and have some restart file that is closer to what you're expecting to get. But in, in the very rare case that you might want to start with I start eight for whatever reason, and you want exact reproducibility, this capability now exists, but it is not something, it's not a hack, but it is something so uncommon, you will probably not care about that. Yeah. When, uh, my, just one other use of I star eight is that we've done for like hysteresis experiments. If you have a, if you run a simulation and, and you cover the planet in ice and then you want to start the new planet with a high CO2 or something like that, you can I star eight with, uh, with the ice covered planet as your, as your initial condition. <laughs> Thanks for pointing that out, Chris. Yeah. And just couple more things I wanted to add. Uh, first of all, uh, I mean, I, st starting new run from I start equal to eight uh, from restart file nearly always works. But I think uh, Mike had this problem that uh, when you change your calendar, actually you have to be careful because uh, that uh, can mess these things up and actually you need a, some small hack. Basically you have to reset uh, the time counter in your restart file to, to zero. And I guess you don't want to discuss it right now, but we probably will put it uh, extra information into documentation that uh, basically you have to start from uh, from January, use January once uh, restart file and reset counter to zero. Then basically you can start any new calendar. Uh, but, uh, that's one thing. And other thing just wanted to mention like from like from the uh, model structure point of view, actually your restart file is exactly the same file as a checkpoint file that is written uh, periodically, fort one and fort two. The only difference is that uh, checkpoint files also include uh, diagnostics, which are accumulated every month, and the restart file doesn't include them. So you probably don't care, but uh, just uh, you may keep it in, uh, in mind that that's basically the same file and uh, all the arrays are the same there. So if you want to compare something, you can do this. Uh. Okay.
Okay, great. Uh, okay, Igor, so why don't you, we'll move on to the next section. Okay. So, yeah, I'll, I'll be talking about land surface part of the, of the model. Uh, and yes, uh, good morning, by the way. <laughs> I'm Igor Alenov. Uh, I'm one of the developers of, uh, of Model E and uh, Rocket Radio. So, and I will start from, uh, from Mars and deck because it follows naturally uh, what Tom was discussing us. So this first slide actually shows the section from Mars and deck, uh, how basically you describe your planet in your run deck. And uh, you may notice that there are basically two sections related to Mar uh, specific to Mars. When you look at the Mars template, uh, you can open it now if you want to, but that's basically information you need to, uh, that is shown on the screen. So at the very at top of the template, you will see this defined planet param like Mars uh, uh, instruction. And that basically, as uh, I mentioned earlier, it serves two, two purposes like this defined planet params, uh, something automatically triggers certain functionality in the model and say, which tells, well, don't use default uh, Earth uh, parameters, but use actually the parameters which are specified for particular uh, planet and basically trigger a lot of uh, functionality that deals with those parameters. Uh, and like Mars, uh, well, for some reason, somebody put this name and it still remains in the in the code. Uh, that's basically Mar uh, tells uh, that's the name of the Mars section in the uh, in the code. And the reason why uh, definition of the planet is split uh, into part in the code and part in the run deck is uh, is because uh, certain parameters. Uh, just have to be known at the uh, compile time. So we cannot put them into the run deck because run deck basically is being read during the runtime. We would like to switch every, uh, everything into the run deck because it's more convenient uh, for users to, uh, uh, to put uh, the entire description of the planet to the run deck. But for, uh, for now it's not uh, possible. So basically for each uh, planet that you create, you will have two sections, one section in the, uh, in the code, and I guess uh, Chris will be talking about uh, that today, how to put it in, so I will now describe it. And other part in the in, in the run deck, and this is what you see for Mars in the run deck. That's basically the, uh, are the parameters that uh, Tom was describing, so we just show the specific numbers here. And for Mars, I guess that's the only exclude exclusion where we actually use uh, the scaling parameters for the distance from the sun rather than uh, uh, solar insulation uh, in, in the run deck. Uh, but that's basically because uh, it's the same sun. Uh, the only th difference is just the distance from the sun. So that's what we use. And we probably can go to the next slide. Uh, okay, that's uh, basically what you will see in your PRT file, your log file, uh, when you use Mars run deck, it will, this uh, part of the printout just reproduces what uh, basically you put into the run deck. So it's good to check to, uh, when you create a new planet to see that, uh, it, uh, that uh, the model really understood what you put in. You probably don't have to spend more time on this. So can go next slide, please. Yeah, so this is uh, like important output uh, based on your orbital parameters. Uh, the model will print out uh, your calendar. So it's good to uh, check it uh, to see if it makes sense to you. So this is Mars calendar. And uh, you see that uh, basically have 12 months uh, as an, on Earth, uh, just the months are roughly twice longer. Uh, they have non-equal uh, non uh, length, and I think that's uh, because of the uh, of the eccentricity of the planet. Uh, that's uh, what Tom was talking about, like about the angles uh, devoted for each uh, month. Uh, so yeah, uh, one important thing here is that the uh, model prints you a vernal equinox uh, time, and that is 
important uh, all actually all those dates are important but at least for mars it's important uh, when you compare to observations because you have to basically look uh, at the at some uh, checkpoint in the observations uh, so that you sync your calendars uh, so i'm doing it, uh, it in it with respect to vernal equinox because usually all the uh, diagnostics uh, i mean all the observations start from vernal equinox if you look at uh, observations for mars but for exoplanets probably you don't care well but anyway uh, it's uh, good to look at the such things so can we go to the next slide please uh, okay so this is mars topography we are using uh, uh, next slide please uh, okay, and uh, I guess this result, uh, this slide was already shown. That's uh, I guess most of you know that uh, Mars condenses uh, part of this, its atmosphere seasonally at the poles, uh, and uh, this slide shows uh, uh, the pressure measured, by, atmospheric pressure measured by Viking uh, two mission. Uh, so this gray point show Viking two mission uh, atmospheric pressure, and uh, the black line shows uh, what our model can uh, uh, produces uh, when we model Mars. But uh, this functionality actually is enabled only in version two of uh, Rocket 3D, so you will not see it in the current uh, model that you have download downloaded. You have to wait uh, for a month or two when we release uh, model two, uh, uh, Planet two model uh so yeah basically this is uh this shows how functionality of condensing co2 atmosphere at the poles works uh sorry next slide please uh, uh this slide shows uh, how you specify al albedo so that's kind of important for you like when you create a new planet uh basically uh, at least for for the land planet uh, like one of the important things is just specify surface albedo and that's also le legacy code uh, unfortunately we don't have uh, an input parameters where you could uh, in input file where, where you could just set uh, uh, albedo of the planet uh, you actually have to specify it in terms of uh, uh, what we call vegetation fractions uh, and vegetation fractions are all fractions of uh, of the soil uh, occupied uh, by different vegetations, including bar soil. And bar, for bar soil, we have two types of bar soil. We have bright soil and dark soil. And bright soil is uh, the only purpose of that, that we have two uh, types of uh, soil is just to specify soil albedo. And bright, so, bright soil is uh is uh soil that has albedo 0.5 and dark soil has albedo zero so basically to specify your albedo you just have to give uh, fractions of your black uh, bright and dark soil so that you get the right albedo and that's what is done for mars so in theory yeah you're not supposed to create any planet which has uh, soil with albedo brighter than 0.5 but actually, I can use a hack. You can use uh, negative fractions uh, in your uh, in your definition, so you can get basically any albedo. You can have dark soil like ne negative fraction and give more. Uh, you give like more than one fraction to the bright soil. So you can experiment with it and just see if uh, you get the right al albedo. But uh, that's pretty straightforward. So. So and yeah, on all fractions are fractions of uh, of one. So, so basically, all your vegetation fractions should uh, get, uh, should add to one. Yeah, and the rest uh, of fractions are like for real vegetations. Uh, vegetation uh, really, you probably. I'm not sure if you want to do anything for exoplanet with vegetation. Uh, uh, because basically that's tuned to Earth, but I'll talk about this on, on the next slide. So uh, just uh, the oh okay, uh, let's skip it. Uh, uh, okay, this is this slide shows uh, the, uh, 
in the schematics of our land surface. Uh, it's kind of a busy slide. You probably don't want to look at everything, uh, but basically what it tells uh, how, how our land surface uh, constructed. So what it has, it has six layers of, uh, of soil uh, up to 3.5 meters deep. Uh, and uh, the soil layers are taken, uh, uh, the depth of soil layer is basically also tuned uh, to Earth's calendar, uh, Earth's, uh, Orbit, uh, orbital parameters in such a way that basically upper soil layer is sort of uh, mimics, uh, I mean, uh, models uh, your diurnal cycle well, uh, and the whole thickness of the soil models your seasonal cycle well. So uh, that was chosen like for basically yes, Earth's orbital parameters, but uh, you don't really need to change that. Uh, for other planets, unless uh, you have some extreme case, then you might want like, to experiment with thicker uh, soil. But we don't recommend actually to change it, just uh, for your information. And uh, the soil is uh, the land surface is, is split into two pieces: uh, uh, bare soil and vegetated soil are treated separately. I don't have time, I guess, to speak about all this. Uh, details but yes just you have six layers of uh, soil uh, on both parts but uh, on the vegetated part you also have uh, vegetation on top of it uh, and this plot shows you all the fluxes of water and energy that ex exchanged with atmosphere and then uh, vegetation also changes those fluxes with uh, with soil and also we have uh, snow snow model which represented by three layers of snow. So you have a separate snow uh, fractions for uh, bar soil, separate from for vegetated soil. And also uh, soil is not completely covered by snow. I mean, there is a fraction of uh, vegetation. So you always have small, small uh, bar fraction of uh, soil, even if you have snow. So anyways, this uh, all flux is uh, uh, exchanged with soil. And uh, soil uh, has, uh, what, what, what it gets water from uh, atmosphere through precipitation and can evaporate uh, water back to uh, atmosphere. And it also has a, a runoff flux, uh, surface runoff and underground runoff. That's uh, the water which is removed from the surface uh, immediately uh, after the rain or later at later time from the soil uh, and this soil goes to local lakes you always have local lakes even if you don't define them uh, um, if you define them then you have certain uh, shape for them if not then uh, lakes uh, just assume certain default default shapes and uh, if you don't specify river fractions, the river uh, uh, directions, then your lakes are always local. So they can accumulate locally and then evaporate locally. But if you define a river, a river directions, then lakes exchange uh, water between the, between the cells and eventually water will get to your ocean. Uh, and uh, I don't know if I want to say anything else here soil yeah uh soil equilibrium uh it's kind of important to when you create a new planet to think about uh, how it will get to equilibrium because if you create completely flat soil for example then uh, your water uh, once you put water in the in the soil it can be removed only by capillary uptake uh, uh, because the water it's important also water evaporated only from the top so, uh, soil layer you don't have cracks uh, or any penetration of uh, vapor deeper into the soil so basically to evaporate uh, water from the soil it has to be taken by capillary forces to the very top and that's very slow process so if you have put a lot of water uh, into the soil in initial conditions or because uh, the model put in it into it because it was out of equilibrium initially, then it takes long time to take water out of the soil. And uh, so 
if your planet is kind of artificial, it's always good to uh, give uh, the, the, your soil certain local slope so that actually you have a, a run runoff which goes to the to, to the run uh, to to the local lakes because uh, runoff is defined by uh, by the local slope and local slope it's it's completely it's kind of artificial thing because it's very difficult to get it from uh, from the topography even if you have high resolution topography because it's defined basically on the scale of uh, tens of meters uh, usually don't have such high resolution topography so you just tune this parameter uh, to get uh, the right uh, uh, the right uh, underground runoff. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, so that's uh, basically just a few more words about uh, vegetation. Uh, vegetation. Yeah, vegetation also, of course, uh, uh, specifies your albedo if you create new vegetation. And the important thing basically to know that vegetation is uh, tuned for Earth. And this is one thing that actually, if you have completely different uh, uh, climate on your planet, then sorry, most likely our vegetation will not work for you or rather even worse, it will do something, but will produce something completely uh, inaccurate. So uh, if you have an exoplanet, you should think twice if you actually want to use any vegetation on it, probably, probably not, uh, or at least think like what kind of vegetation can survive there. Uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, if you forward on the on the right, tell basically you what what your total water uh, balance is. Uh, it's kind of obvious that uh, the total water is basically the water which you have in the atmosphere, like as a vapor, uh, water in the clouds. And then you have uh, snow on the on the ground. You have groundwater on the on the ground, and you have uh, uh, lakes. If uh, you have water in the lakes, and that's basically your total water not including ocean of course because uh, in this discussion i'm ignoring ocean but yes you also have water in the ocean and uh, for those people who deal with vegetation uh, they should know that uh, not all water is available for vegetation but basically only water which is uh, liquid but not uh, frozen uh, and also there is a notion of uh, hydros uh, hygroscopic water which basically Though present in the soil, it's bound to the soil uh, texture and cannot be removed. Uh, so I guess I don't have time to discuss this. So next slide, please. Uh, have anything? Yeah, this is just an example of a soil file which describes uh, your soil initial conditions. So this is a uh, just a dump from NetCDF file that you can do and see dump man, minus h uh, for any netcdf file any of our input files and that's what you will see basically what kind of uh, data in, is in there and that's basically what i will already discuss briefly so like at the bottom there are four arrays which you basically set for for, for ground hydrology dz uh, is uh, thicknesses of the soil layers you better don't change them from the default ones uh, because as i said uh, it wasn't tested for anything else, so you should use uh, those uh, Q and QK. It's basically the same array, just defined uh, in the so uh, at the centers of the soil layers or at the boundaries. You probably would not uh, define those separately. And those are textures of your soil. And the textures are sand, silt, uh, clay, peat, and rock. Uh, so you may need to specify them separately for your run deck. And SL is local slope, what I was talking about. Uh, uh, the best uh, way to set it, just to look at the uh, at the Earth uh, and see where you have topography similar to what you want to use for your, uh, for your planet and use SL from, from that uh, cell on Earth. Because as I said, it's it's kind of tuned to get uh, the correct uh, runoff. And I think that's all what I had. Uh, can we go to the next slide to see if it's... 
yeah, that's not my slide at all. Right, so but, that's. Uh, that's for Costas. So thank you, Igor. So we just have two more slides before we take a break. So Costas, do you want to talk to this slide? Yes, of course. So the, um, the way to, we have uh, mentioned yesterday things about uh, equilibrium and uh, when do you know that something is in equilibrium or not, uh, your simulation. So this is uh, mostly determined by the plot on the top. So you see on the x-axis, the this is the number of years as a function, uh, uh, which is since what we call a cold restart, which means that you start the model from initial conditions with i start equals two. And uh, you see on the y-axis, the net radiation of the planet in watts per meter square averaged over the whole planet. And uh, the number we mentioned yesterday is that this should be, if, the, if this stays constant, uh, dynamically constant, of course, there are, there are ups and downs, but if it stays, the mean of it over a number of years stays within 0.2 from zero, then we consider that a model in equilibrium. And there are several lines here. It doesn't matter really which one is which, but the, the important thing I want you to, sh to see is that these are, uh, this is something that takes time to go down to the, to the range we want. For example, the, the dark blue line that you see is nearly immediately at equilibrium. And that is uh, probably by design because of what this particular run is. It doesn't really matter for this discussion. But then other things like the red line and the, the, the block of the red line around one watt meter per meter square uh, and all the other lines underneath it, it slowly goes down, but it takes centuries probably. And then there is this gray and cyan lines at the very top that they start pretty, pretty high up. And then they gradually and uniform and fairly stably go down to zero. And um, so uh, this is the, the if, there is, if you are looking for just one diagnostic to look at and say something about the equilibrium of the model, this is it. And uh, an important thing is that this has implications. Uh, the, if you have a line, if you have something that is positive for a very long time, this heats up the model so that it make it reach equilibrium. If you have something negative, this cools down the model. And, but this is not necessarily the case because other hydro, the hydrological things are happening and a lot of clouds are changing as you move uh, to a different radiation balance regime. So things are changing uh, quite a lot. And uh, the surface temperature that you see, the global mean surface temperature that you see at the bottom panel doesn't exactly follow that net radiation, but um, it is related. So it, the, the surface, you would eventually want to see that the global mean surface temperature is also in equilibrium. But uh, if, again, if you are only looking at one thing, you look at the net radiation of the planet. Uh, let's go next. And uh, this is an example from uh, some other simulations uh, that we have done. And uh, you see that uh, different uh, variables, different diagnostics and how they look like. So the top panel, the top one is the ocean ice fraction that you see that in this particular run, it goes up a little bit and then it slowly decays down to its equilibrium that you see in the dashed line. The ground ice is the second one. The, 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 the Ocean ice thickness is the third one that after 1500 years in this particular case is still going up. So you are not in equilibrium yet. And then the snow depth is, I don't see the black line, but you can see the, fall, the green line that is uh, probably in equilibrium. The ground water, I don't know what this one is. Some other diagnostic that is pretty quickly into equilibrium. And the bottom one is the mass of water in uh, rivers and lakes. And you see that this one is also slowly going up. This is actually the one, this latter one is the one that uh, will 
probably take you the most time to equilibrate in, from the head, uh, from the head, ground hydrology and the in general the water budget. It is the one that is the slowest to uh, to build up to its equilibrium time. So for our Earth simulations, we start from uh, a case which is probably lower than what we should be starting, and it takes about five to six thousand years to reach a perfect equilibrium. This sounds a lot, but the good news is that other than this one diagnostic, it doesn't really matter. I mean, you can see that uh, most of the diagnostics are pretty balanced, pretty equilibrated already, although this uh, total mass of uh, water in rivers and lakes is still uh, drifting, going up. Um, so you need to see the, and and the, you need to see the in general more diagnostics, see how they behave, but the the key thing is the net red planet. Next one. Don't think there is one, right? No. So this is for after the break. Yes. Okay, so we'll take a break. Uh, sorry, it's a little bit shorter today than yesterday. So we take an eight-minute break. So save your questions for the Q and A, and Eric Wolf. Uh, our radiation expert will just join us to talk about the radio transfer scheme. And then uh, we're fortunate again this year to have Geronimo Villanueva and Thomas Fauché talking about uh, how to use Rocky 3D to look at observables that we're interested in for exoplanetary stuff and look at how to create spectra and things of that nature. Okay, so see you in about uh, seven, eight minutes. <laughs> 